Wife cheated with her gym trainer, demanded half of everything in our divorce. But she didn't know my dad secretly owned our house and savings. I never thought I'd be posting here, but here I am. I'm a 35-year-old accountant, been working at a local firm for almost 10 years now. I've always been a pretty practical guy, level-headed and all that, and I guess that's why I'm able to stay calm through all of this. Anyway, I'm married to Kathy, who's 33. We've been together for around 5 years but married for 2. No kids, which, looking back now, is probably a blessing. Kathy hasn't worked since we got married. She used to be in marketing, but after we tied the knot, she wanted to take a break and focus on us. I didn't mind, I make enough to support both of us, and I figured it was temporary. We've got a house, a decent savings account, nothing extravagant, but enough to be comfortable. Kathy's been home most of the time, but lately, things started to change. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when I noticed it, but Kathy began acting distant. She'd stay out longer when she went out with friends or to the gym. She stopped being affectionate and would get defensive when I asked what was going on. At first, I chalked it up to stress or just a rough patch in the marriage. But as the weeks went on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. And boy, was I right. One evening, while Kathy was in the shower, her phone buzzed with a message, and out of pure reflex, I glanced over at it. It was from a guy named Derek. I didn't think much of it at first, but something about the way the message was worded felt off. Can't wait to see you tomorrow, babe, it read. I opened it, and what I found confirmed my worst fears. She'd been seeing Derek, her gym trainer, for months. The texts were explicit, full of plans for the future, plans that clearly didn't involve me. I sat there, frozen, staring at the phone. I couldn't believe it. The woman I married, the person I trusted, was cheating on me. But instead of rage or sadness, I just felt numb. Maybe it was the shock, or maybe it was my pragmatic nature kicking in, but I knew I had to confront her without losing my cool. When she came out of the bathroom, I calmly handed her the phone and asked her to explain. At first, she tried to deny it, saying it was nothing, just a joke, but when I read some of the texts back to her, she realized there was no point in lying. I want a divorce, she said, with no sign of remorse. No apology, no guilt, nothing. Just a cold, detached statement. She admitted she'd been seeing Derek for a while and that she wasn't happy in our marriage anymore. She didn't bother to sugarcoat it, she was leaving me for him. But what really threw me was her next move. Without missing a beat, she started talking about dividing assets. She said she wanted half of everything, the house, the savings, everything we'd built together. She even suggested she deserved it because she had sacrificed her career to support mine. I couldn't believe the nerve. I stayed calm. Though, maybe it's because I'd already emotionally checked out at that point, or maybe because, deep down, I knew something she didn't. So, I agreed. I told her if she wanted a divorce, I wouldn't fight her on it. She could have half, of what she thought I had. She looked surprised, probably expecting a fight or some sort of emotional breakdown. But I wasn't about to give her that satisfaction. What Kathy didn't know, and what I didn't feel the need to tell her, was that almost all of our assets were in my dad's name. You see, my father is a pretty shrewd man. Years ago, when I first started making decent money, he suggested I put all my major assets in his name. He explained that it would be a safeguard in case anything ever went wrong in the future, whether it be debts, lawsuits, or, as it turns out, a cheating spouse. At the time, I didn't think much of it, it just seemed like smart financial planning. So, when Kathy demanded half of everything, I knew she wouldn't be getting what she expected. On paper, I didn't have much, just a modest bank account, a car in my name, and a few other odds and ends. The house? Technically, it belonged to my dad. The bulk of my savings? Also in accounts under my dad's control. Instead of getting into a messy court battle, I suggested we handle things through mediation. I figured it would be easier and cheaper for both of us that way. She agreed, clearly thinking she'd walk away with a significant chunk of my assets. Little did she know. This arrangement with my dad had been in place for years, and honestly, I had forgotten about it until the divorce talks began. It wasn't that I had planned for a scenario like this, but I can't deny that I'm grateful for my father's foresight. The house we lived in was technically owned by him, as were most of the investments and savings that Kathy had her eyes on. I had always kept a low financial profile in my own name, living modestly enough that no one, including Kathy, really questioned it. As soon as the divorce process started, I told my dad in. He wasn't thrilled about the situation, what father would be. But he understood the importance of keeping everything tight-lipped. We consulted with a lawyer just to ensure that everything was airtight and legally sound. Turns out, everything was in perfect order. Kathy could demand all she wanted, but there wasn't much in my name for her to take. Kathy didn't waste any time. She hired an aggressive divorce attorney, one of those sharks that promises to take everything they can. Meanwhile, I hired a low-key but reputable lawyer, someone who specialized in cases like mine where there were tricky financial dynamics at play. I didn't want to make a big scene out of this, but I also wasn't about to let Kathy and her lawyer push me around. 
The first step in the divorce process was asset disclosure, which, as you can imagine, didn't go as Kathy had planned. I laid everything out in full, just as required by law. But when she saw how little there actually was in my name, her lawyer's confident grin faltered. I could tell they were both confused, maybe even suspicious, but there wasn't much they could do about it. Everything I provided was truthful, and there were no hidden assets. She then started berating me right there itself while calling me an asshole and accused me of lying. But like I said I provided everything I had. After a bunch of accusations and raised voices I left and said that we will discuss everything once she has calmed down. Now, here I am, turning to Reddit because I'm not sure if I've handled this the right way. So, Reddit, am I the asshole for agreeing to give her half of what's mine while knowing she's not actually getting anything close to what she expects? Update 1. So, things are starting to heat up. After the initial asset disclosure, Kathy was in complete disbelief. She clearly thought I was hiding something while accusing and berating me, and her lawyer wasn't much better. The look on his face when they saw the modest numbers on paper was priceless. It didn't take long for them to start demanding a more thorough investigation. Kathy kept asking where all the money was, the house, the investments, the savings she assumed we had. She couldn't believe that after years of marriage, there wasn't more to split. Her lawyer quickly hired a forensic accountant to dig deeper, thinking I had stashed money away in hidden accounts. At first, I was a little nervous. Not because I had anything to hide but because I knew this would only prolong the whole process. But after talking with my lawyer and going over everything again, I realized there was nothing they could find. Legally, everything I had claimed was 100% accurate, and there was no trail that would lead them to the assets in my dad's name. As the investigation dragged on, you could see the frustration building on Kathy's face. She was used to getting what she wanted, but this time, there was nothing there for her to take. It's like she couldn't wrap her head around the fact that she was walking away with next to nothing. Kathy's next move was to try and argue that she had contributed significantly to my career and our lifestyle. She claimed that by staying home and managing the household, she had enabled me to focus on my work and advance in my career. While I'll admit that having her take care of things at home was helpful at times, it wasn't as if I was running a Fortune 500 company. I'm a mid-level accountant, and my job has been pretty stable for years now. There wasn't some meteoric rise in my income that she could point to and say, I helped him get there. Still, she tried. She pushed the idea that she had sacrificed her own career in marketing to support mine, but the truth is, she hadn't worked long before deciding she wanted to stay home. And even then, it was a choice she made, not something I ever asked of her. Her lawyer brought this up repeatedly, trying to paint me as someone who had benefited from her sacrifice, but again, there wasn't much to support that claim. At one point, they even tried to involve my parents in the proceedings. Kathy wanted to prove that they had been giving me money under the table, or that I had been hiding assets with their help. This part made me especially angry. My parents had nothing to do with this, and dragging them into it was a low blow. Fortunately, my lawyer was able to shut down those attempts pretty quickly, but it was clear Kathy was getting desperate. As the divorce proceedings dragged on, Kathy decided to take things into her own hands. If she couldn't get what she wanted through the courts, she was going to try and ruin my reputation in other ways. She started telling everyone in our social circle that I had been hiding money from her, that I had been financially abusive throughout our marriage. I couldn't believe the lies she was spreading. I'd hear from mutual friends about how she was going on and on about how I was leaving her with nothing, how I had manipulated her into thinking we had more than we did. She even took to social media, posting vague but pointed comments about narcissistic partners and betrayals. Some people sided with her, of course. There are always people who will take the side of the person who looks like they've been wronged, but most of our closer friends knew better. They knew I wasn't the type to do something like that. It was frustrating to see her try to ruin my reputation just because things weren't going her way, but I tried not to let it get to me. I knew the truth, and the people who really mattered knew it too. Besides, I had bigger things to focus on, like making sure she didn't take me for more than she deserved. While Kathy was busy running a smear campaign, I was making sure all my bases were covered. My lawyer and I were in constant communication, making sure we had all the evidence we needed to prove my side of the story. I documented every interaction I had with Kathy, every demand she made, and every time she tried to paint me as the bad guy. I knew that if this ever went to court, having that documentation would be crucial. I also started gathering evidence of her affair with Derek. While adultery doesn't always play a huge role in divorce settlements, I wanted to make sure it was clear that she wasn't the victim here. I had screenshots of the texts she exchanged with him, pictures they had taken together, and even statements from some of her friends who had known about the affair but kept quiet. It wasn't that I wanted to humiliate her, I just wanted the truth to come out. On top of that, I started preparing for the inevitable fallout. I knew that once the truth came out, that she wasn't getting half of everything, things were going to get ugly. So I kept my distance, staying focused on my work and my own life while making sure I had everything in place for the next phase of the divorce. One thing that made all of this even more interesting was Derek's reaction to everything. When Kathy initially told him she wanted to leave me for him, he seemed all for it. They had their little romantic fantasy of starting a new life together. 
But as soon as the divorce proceedings started getting messy, Derek began pulling back. It turns out he wasn't quite as invested in Kathy as she thought. From what I've heard, he started getting cold feet when he realized that being with her might mean dealing with her financial issues. Kathy was expecting this grand new life with Derek, but he wasn't ready to commit to that. In fact, word got out that he started losing clients at the gym because of the scandal. Apparently, people don't want to work with a trainer who's known for getting involved with married women. Now, Derek's been trying to distance himself from Kathy, and she's starting to realize that maybe this wasn't the fairy tale she thought it would be. I almost feel bad for her, but then I remember everything she's done. As for me, I'm feeling conflicted. On one hand, I feel vindicated. I'm glad that I protected my assets, and I'm glad that Kathy isn't walking away with what she expected. But at the same time, I can't help but feel a bit sad. This was my marriage, after all. I loved Kathy once, and I thought we'd build a life together. Seeing it all fall apart like this is tough, even if I know it's for the best. Update 2, things have taken a pretty wild turn since my last update. Kathy is getting desperate, and it's starting to show in the worst ways. She's clearly realized that she's not going to get the payout she expected from this divorce, and now she's trying to make my life hell. The latest is that she's been making threats about ruining my career and my reputation at work. She told me flat out that if I didn't make things easier for her, give her more money, she would make sure everyone at my firm knew what a scumbag I was. At first, I wasn't sure what she meant, but it became clear when she started showing up at my office unannounced. The first time, she was calm, pretending like she just needed to talk. But when I told her there was nothing more to discuss, she snapped. She started raising her voice, saying things like, I'll make sure everyone here knows the truth about you. Fortunately, I was able to get her out of there before it escalated further, but it's clear she's becoming unpredictable. Her behavior at home, well, her temporary home with her parents, has been erratic too. After realizing she wasn't going to walk away with the big payday she expected, she moved back in with her parents. From what I've heard, things haven't been going well for her there. Her parents are supportive, but they're not exactly thrilled with how everything's played out. I guess even they see through her victim act. Mutual friends have told me that she's been lashing out, getting into arguments with her family, and acting like she's on the verge of a breakdown. The legal side of things has gotten more problematic as well. Kathy's lawyer is trying everything they can to dig up dirt on me. They've filed motions to subpoena my parents' financial records, even though my lawyer has repeatedly explained that my parents' assets are not up for grabs in this divorce. It's a clear attempt to rattle me, but it's not working. Kathy's team also filed a motion to depose my colleagues at work, hoping to find something, anything, that might suggest I was hiding assets or receiving under the table income. They're grasping at straws, but it's exhausting to deal with. Every time we think we've handled one of their requests, they come back with another. The whole situation is starting to feel like a never-ending chess match. Every move I make, Kathy and her team try to counter. But I've been staying one step ahead, thanks to my lawyer and the airtight legal protections my father set up years ago. Still, it's draining, and I'm not sure how much longer I can keep this up before we end up in court for real. Speaking of legal proceedings, we've already tried mediation, twice, actually, and both times, it's been a complete disaster. The first session ended after about 20 minutes when Kathy refused to budge on her demand for half of the house and our savings. My lawyer laid out the reality of the situation, that the house was in my father's name and that there wasn't nearly as much money as she thought. But Kathy wouldn't hear it. She stormed out, accusing me of lying and saying that the mediator was biased against her. The second attempt wasn't much better. This time, Kathy showed up with a list of completely unrealistic demands. She wanted full ownership of the house, half of all our savings, even though they barely exist, and alimony for at least five years. When my lawyer calmly explained, again, that she wasn't entitled to any of that, Kathy lost it. She started yelling about how she had sacrificed everything for me and how I was leaving her with nothing. I sat there, trying to stay calm, but inside I was fuming. She was the one who cheated. She was the one who wanted the divorce. And now she's acting like I'm the one ruining her life? It's unbelievable. After that session, it became clear that this divorce is heading for court, whether I like it or not. On top of that, Kathy's been borrowing money from her family and friends to cover her legal fees. She clearly didn't expect the divorce to drag on this long, and now she's running out of funds. I'm not exactly sure how she plans to keep paying her aggressive lawyer, but that's not my problem. The more desperate she gets, the more erratic her behavior becomes. Mutual friends have told me she's been spending most of her time at home, venting to anyone who will listen about how I've ruined her life. It's gotten so bad that some of her friends have started distancing themselves from her. They're tired of the drama and her constant playing of the victim card. It seems like everything Kathy thought she was going to get out of this divorce is slipping through her fingers. Through all of this, I've been doing my best to stay calm and handle things strategically. Every time Kathy makes a new accusation or demand, I counter it with evidence. Every financial document they request, I provide, because I have nothing to hide. My lawyer has been great about making sure we're following the law to the letter, which is more than I can say for Kathy's team.
I've also been working to protect my parents' privacy. Kathy's attempts to drag them into this mess are infuriating, but fortunately, there are legal protections in place to keep her from accessing their financial records. Still, the fact that she's even trying shows just how desperate she is. It's like she thinks if she digs deep enough, she'll find some hidden treasure that I've been keeping from her. But there's nothing to find. Update 3, the day of the court hearing finally arrived, and to say the tension was high would be an understatement. Kathy was the first to testify, and she came out swinging. She made it clear that she believed I had been hiding assets from her all along. She accused me of manipulating our finances, hiding money in secret accounts, and lying to her about how much we really had. She was emotional, painting herself as the victim who had been left with nothing after sacrificing her career to support mine. She was sobbing on the stand at one point, talking about how she had trusted me with everything, only to be blindsided by the divorce and my supposed financial trickery. But then came the real kicker, when my lawyer presented evidence of her affair with Derek. As soon as the texts, pictures, and details of her relationship with him came out. The jury, the judge, everyone could see what was really going on. Kathy's victim narrative started to crumble right before my eyes. At one point, she even tried to downplay the affair, saying it was just a mistake and that it had nothing to do with the divorce. But by then, the damage was done. Her credibility was shot, and it was clear that her financial demands were driven more by greed than anything else. When it was my turn to testify, I made sure to stay calm and stick to the facts. My lawyer had prepped me well, and I knew that getting emotional or defensive wouldn't help my case. I went over everything, how my assets had been structured in my father's name for years, how I had provided full financial disclosures, and how I had tried to handle the divorce amicably through mediation. I also testified about Kathy's threats, her erratic behavior, and the smear campaign she had been running. My lawyer presented documentation of all the accusations she had thrown at me, both publicly and in court, and showed how baseless they were. We laid out the truth about our finances, the house belonged to my father, our savings were modest at best, and there was no secret stash of money that she could lay claim to. The judge seemed to appreciate my straightforwardness. I didn't try to vilify Kathy, but I didn't sugarcoat the reality of what had happened either. The facts were clear, and I made sure to present them without drama or exaggeration. A few key witnesses were called during the trial, and their testimonies helped seal the deal. First, my father took the stand. He explained the financial arrangement we had put in place years ago, how the house was in his name, how the investments were under his control, and how all of this was done as a form of long-term financial protection. He made it clear that these assets were his, not mine, and that Kathy had no legal right to them. Next up was one of my colleagues from work. Kathy's team had tried to argue that I had been hiding money by receiving under the table payments or bonuses, but my colleague shut that down quickly. He testified about my modest income and my regular, transparent salary. There were no secret bonuses, no hidden sources of income, just the straightforward paycheck that I had disclosed. These witnesses were crucial in showing that Kathy's accusations were baseless. The judge could see that there was no grand conspiracy on my part, just a simple, transparent financial arrangement that Kathy had never bothered to understand. After days of testimony and legal arguments, the judge finally delivered the verdict. It was a huge relief to hear the words, the divorce would be granted in my favor. Kathy's demands for half of the house and our savings were denied outright. The judge ruled that because the house and most of our assets were in my father's name, Kathy had no claim to them. The only thing she was awarded was a minimal amount of alimony, and even that was for a short duration, barely enough to cover her legal fees, let alone the lifestyle she was hoping to maintain. The judge made it clear that Kathy's affair and her lack of contribution to the household finances played a role in his decision. He saw through her attempts to paint herself as a victim and ruled accordingly. As the decision was read out, I felt a massive weight lift off my shoulders. The months of stress, the constant accusations, the fear of losing everything, all of it melted away in that moment. I knew that, legally, I was in the clear. Kathy, on the other hand, didn't take the verdict well. As soon as the judge finished, she burst into tears, shouting that the system was unfair and that I had cheated her out of what was rightfully hers. She stormed out of the courtroom, leaving her lawyer looking exasperated. I'm not sure what she expected, but it was clear that she hadn't prepared herself for the possibility of losing. For me, the immediate feeling was one of relief. I thanked my lawyer, who had done a good job throughout the whole process, and headed out of the courthouse. My phone was buzzing with texts from friends and family, congratulating me on the outcome. Word had spread quickly, and the local community was already talking about the case. It felt good to know that the truth had come out, and that I could finally move on with my life. But Kathy wasn't done. Outside the courthouse, she had a full-blown meltdown in front of a small crowd. She started screaming about how I had lied and manipulated the system, and how she was going to appeal the decision. The problem is, she doesn't have the money to do that. Her lawyer made it clear during the proceedings that she was running out of funds, and from what I've heard, she's still borrowing money from family and friends just to get by. That being said, I'm incredibly grateful for my father's advice and foresight when it came to protecting my finances. Without his help, who knows what kind of mess I'd be in right now.
I'm also thankful for the support of my friends, family, and colleagues, who stuck by me even when Kathy was spreading rumors and trying to destroy my reputation. Looking forward, I'm hopeful. I know it's going to take time to fully recover from this, both emotionally and financially, but I'm ready to move on with my life. I've learned some valuable lessons from all of this, and I won't be making the same mistakes again. For now, I'm just focusing on getting back to a sense of normalcy and enjoying the peace that comes with having this chapter finally closed.